Well, please join me in welcoming two of my favorite musicians to play with, uh, Tim Lefebvre on bass and Wayne Krantz on guitar. <laughs> We've been playing together a little over 10 years now, and um, back in the day we played in this little club in New York City called the 55 Bar every Thursday. And uh, it really became a band, and um, has done wonders for my playing um, and development as a player, and um, especially on the improvisational side of things and trying to be creative on the drums and finding new things to play. And we actually did two records from those days uh, that Wayne put out under his name, uh, Greenwich Mean and Your Basic Live from the 55 Bar. And um, we actually just finished a studio record entitled Krantz, Carlock, Lefebvre that is uh, soon to be released. Um, we're just going to play for you um, and discuss how we approach the music. And uh, just please think of some questions you want to ask and um, just keep it loose. And so we'll just start by playing Old New.
Thanks. That was entitled Old, New. Um, what we do in this trio is we play the written parts that Wayne writes. And once that's been done, uh, and there's many different forms of those written parts, every tune has a different way of approaching those. But once those are done, we, we go into what we call blowing sections. And when, when we're in those blowing sections, we are thinking in eight bar phrases always. So we're all improvising together um, in, within those eight bar phrases. And we have a lot of things that happen. Not only are we staying connected, you know, musically and crea creatively, we're using those forms of eight bars to cue different directions in the music. It can go different places. In this tune, we just did um, a tempo cue that went down in tempo, and then uh, it was cued back up. Um, and we have several of those. We have one that's called up and way up, and we have a down and a way down. Um, and it means basically what it sounds like. Um, and the way that that happened was, is Wayne looked at us and said down, and we're in the midst of that eight bar phrase. We have to keep, you know, we have to know where we are within that phrase. At the end of that particular phrase is when that cue will happen at the very top of the next phrase on one. So that's what happened. We just went down. It's not a metric modulation or anything mathematical. It's just something we just agree on right away. And we've done it enough to where it just kind of happens, you know, okay. You know, we, so we could actually demonstrate that. Um, and I think you were cueing some key changes as well right. within the phrase. Um, obviously, that's for Tim. <laughs> um, sometimes I might want to uh, go with that or not. I might just stay where I am. But if I hear that maybe if I change with them, it might be cool. Maybe not. You know, a lot of times I'll just stay, stay where I am and let that happen. Um, and uh, I guess we could demonstrate some of the tempo cues to show how that works. And then there's many others that we can touch on as well uh, that'll happen in the tunes that we're going to play. And we'll discuss them when we come to them. We'll, we'll play um, just some eight bar phrases of, of improvising. And you'll cue down or way down, up, way up. See how it goes. Cool. So like one, two, G. One, two, three.
Yeah, we should mention that um, Keith controls the changes in tempo in terms of what they actually are. I, I was cueing them. I mean, I'm kind of directing the thing um, during the phrases to be enacted at the beginning of the next phrase, like Keith was explaining. But uh, it's basically, since we're not, it's not a metric modulation, I don't, at least not in a mathematical way. We don't know whether it's a subdivision of a triplet or anything like that. I mean, maybe sometimes it is accidentally, but we're not thinking about it like that. It's just a tempo change. And we want it to be as kind of drastic and unexplained and almost, in a way, irrational. I mean, hopefully it's rational musically, but just mathematically irrational. That's the effect that we want. So it's Keith's responsibility to just write on the one because we decided a long time ago that was the most efficient way to do this, rather than trying to figure out how to lead up with a fill in that new time or something to actually make the shift right on one. And then it's, it's up to Tim and me to get on board with that tempo as fast as possible. And we've gotten better at it over the years because we kind of know, we sort of feel what down means for Keith. It's down and way down and up and way up from whatever tempo we're at. So that's a relative thing, too. It's like wherever, whatever speed we're at, down means a different tempo than it would if we were playing at a slower tempo when we went down. So it's always relative to the tempo we're in. Um, what, happens, I, what happens if you want to play the head at the, same sp at the same tempo you started it, but you went down, way down, up, way up? We all, we have, that's a great question. I mean, if the head is the kind of head that has to be played at a specific tempo, they aren't all like that. Some of them can be played at wildly different tempos, and they work. But if it's a head that has to be played at a specific tempo, then we know to always return to that tempo for the head, no matter what changes we're making in the blowing. When, we go, when I cue the head out, we go back to head tempo at that point. And if that fluctuates slightly, it usually doesn't matter that much. Yeah, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be exactly, exactly. but in the same zone. Mm -hmm. you know. And I should say that this came from, this idea of the tempo changes came from a record that, uh, of Wayne's called Greenwich Mean, and where he edited some, some different sections together where this happened, these shifts of tempo. And then we just tried to learn how to emulate that. And this is how we came up doing that. Came up with the idea of, you know, within the phrase, he cues the tempo change, you know. Is there a way you cue a feel change, maybe, like, or like to a shuffle or something like that, or is that your own choice? I think it's more we, we kind of listen to each other, and it's, it's, it's all of us choosing what to do. I think if things get really slow, it, it, can, it can kind of go into different feels, you know. So you don't really, like, change the feel right on the one? Sometimes. sometimes. Or, like, you slip into it? Or? No, yeah. sometimes we do. Is that I think something even that, that, Wayne, is that something that you cue? No, that's just I never do that. That's really cool. I've never done I that. I think even on the, if I'm not mistaken, the way we just played the last tune, um, w when we went down, we kind of went into kind of a hip hop kind of. Yeah. Sometimes it's not some intentional kind of though. Swung, you know. Yeah. And then when we went back to the head, we went back to the straight, you know, sixteenth note kind of vibe. So it's just listening to each other and connecting with it. It's sometimes it's based on you know like like if I'm guessing what area he's in, I, I always drop a one in, but. Sometimes, like, I, I don't know where the next 16th note is, so I place it late, so then it turns into, like, and he starts playing kind of hip hop -y and it's, it's cool. You know, it's, it's always, like, kind of, like, totally in the moment, so. I was going to ask, do y'all sometimes play almost like a longer note on beat one just until he plays beat two, or do you just kind of no. dive in? Not, not consciously, no. I mean, on the thing we just did when we were running through those different tempos, except for one of them, which I kind of misjudged, I was just guessing, and I guessed—I mean, guessing about where it was going to be—and I guessed right on. I think on all of them except one. So I was just right away. I was filling in with the next eighth note or the next sixteenth note. But it doesn't always work like that. You know? <laughs> but I mean, if it happens pretty quick, you know, we're talking—it's never going to happen. It's never going to take longer than a beat. So if a beat is kind of loose, you know, I mean. But when it's nailed, it's such a great effect. Yeah. You know, to it's fun for us because it breaks things up, where we can kind of start over mm -hmm. and and let something else happen, let right. something else develop. So it's cool for us in that respect, and then for the audience, it's just such an unexpected thing to happen. Well, you're yeah. setting the, you're set, I mean, you're calling out the cue, basically, but, but Keith, you're pretty much um, establishing what those next eight bars are going to be, right? Yeah, I guess you could for say it that somewhat, way. Kind of like that? That's yeah. right. I just have to be... And then, they, and then you guys just like within a half a second are on board with what, right. what Keith is basically calling out That's right. what he's changing to. Yeah. And the tempo has to, you know, whatever we shift into, the tempo has to be locked down, like, really from, from the first beat. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. Not, it can't go anywhere within itself. 
Yeah? What are some good tips you guys have for improvising in this type of setting? Like things to be aware of? The way that I see it, in one way, just to describe it, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of guitar trios in the world, and, and a lot of uh, what we're trying to do, um, and a lot of this vision comes from Wayne, and we've, we've picked up on it and, and contributed to it, but I think what we're trying to do is um, avoid things that have been done a lot, like the bass and drums playing more repetitive patterns all the time for him to solo over, for Wayne to solo over in the, in the guitar. Although that does happen in the music when we play, we, we do get into repetitive stuff. Uh, but um, we also can basically improvise together, and there's, there's different ways that we can do that. Um, w when we improvise together, sometimes it can, it can be like a dialogue, like we're talking, you know, talking to each other and reacting. Uh, Wayne has an incredible rhythmic f way of playing guitar and his phrasing, uh, as does Tim, and I think we just all connect with that and find places to, to uh, you know, answer what was just played or, or play along with it, you know, as you're, you're just kind of reacting to what, what is happening. And then there's the other type of improvisation of where we, we might be a lot more repetitive. We'll get into something that sounds really cool. It even can sound like it's composed, but it's, it just happened on the spot. So we'll stay there. And I think that reminds me, one of the cues we have is called freeze. <laughs> we're, we're into something that, you know, is really repetitive. And Wayne will look at us and say, freeze, Remem meaning remember what this is, because we're going to come back to it later within this tune. So we'll go off into something else, maybe a completely different tempo or vibe. And then he'll say, go back. Is that the one? Go back. And then we'll go right back to what that freeze was. You know, so, it's, it's, so then to the listener and to us, it's, we're creating something that uh, you can latch on to and, and uh, you know, just really different things for a trio to do that I think is, is really unique. It do you want to like, add to that? Yeah, just I was just thinking in answer to the, uh, you know, tips about improvising. I mean, something that makes it possible to do all the stuff that we're doing and talking about today is the fact that we all have, a, we have agreed, an agreed upon um, 16th note. Like, we're connected on the grid. So, and we're also, that's the, that's the kind of vertical connection that we have. But then we've got this horizontal connection on the phrase, which is like fours, eights, and sixteens within that grid, or ov over on the top of that grid, let's say. So we've got it kind of up and down and horizontally, this rhythmic connection, which makes sense of a lot of, it allows us to experiment a lot but still sound like we're kind of together. If that wasn't happening, if there were a lot more flams and stuff, if we weren't in total agreement with the quarter note, let's call it, um, it would be much harder to, to really try to go off the beaten track because it would sound terrible very fast, you know. It would really sound like we don't know what we're doing. We're trying, I mean, half the time we really kind of don't know what we're doing in the sense that we're not exactly sure where everything's going to go but we can kind of give the impression that we know what we're doing because we're all in, in more or less in rhythmic agreement. And we're that's, hearing those eight-bar phrases. That's major. You know, that's, yeah. that's what makes it all work. Yeah, I mean, that's what allows the, the conscious direction of the improvising to occur, is the phrases. Because we know that if there's a cue, we know when that cue is going to happen. Exactly, we know when it's going to happen. And I don't have to go like, one, two, three, you know. It makes it much more efficient.
So that reminds me of another cue, which is a composed cue, where we were doing some tempo changes within that tune, and um, and he was Wayne was cueing to this composed cue that was a riff, the do na 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 that thing, um, and it. The thing about that one is that it always goes back to that tempo, to the original tempo, no matter where we are. So um, in that tune, the form, it has four parts. So the form is um, laid out in numbers. We have one, two, three, and four. And the way we play it, and the way we usually play it is, one, this is an open key, right? Mm -hmm. Two is a composed part. Da, 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 that's two. And then we'll go back to one again and then, go, and then reprise the number two again. Um, then, you know, we're open again, and then the next cue is uh, three, which is the, the, the composed cue. And then um, once we're in the blowing after that, each time he cues three, we're going back to that tempo. So that's kind of how it's laid out. And then four is the, the outro thing that we played. Um, so that's, that's another uh, example of a cue. And did we do anything else in that that I'm forgetting? Not yeah, we really. We stopped, you and I. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Did. Sorry about that. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah, you can edit that little part out. Right? We have a cue called <laughs> a cut. Um, and a cut is... Basically, well, it is, at the end of whatever phrase we're in, the eighth bar, we're going to break on the end of four. Tim and I, we do it as a band a lot of the times. Wayne will say cut, and we'll just stop on the end of four, and then he'll maybe count in some other composed part or another tempo altogether just to go somewhere else. But Tim and I did it while Wayne was playing. So him and Wayne, I mean, Tim and I, <laughs> Tim and I, looked at each other, we, we don't even have to say cut anymore, we know what we're going to do. So in, within that phrase, we stopped on the end of four. And then we brought it back in at a weird place in the phrase, so that started the next phrase. And we laugh about it, because every time they do that, they choose a place where I'm falling apart, every <laughs> single time. <laughs> it never fails. It's when I'm just stretched beyond performance, you know. So we came back in, we, it basically made it an odd phrase, and those... Those odd phrases hardly ever happen, uh, unless it's in a written section or something. But <laughs> so we came in a bar later, so it made it uh, whatever five bar phrase maybe. Or it's just a, it's a nice way to shift gears. Yeah. Yeah. So Keith, could you talk a little bit about what happens if one of you loses the form? Do you guys just start it again or pick it up? I think back in the day, I used to just hit a big one and hope that I was right, and and they would just latch on. I might get an evil eye every now and then. <laughs> But uh, I think now that we've played enough together, um, you know, if one of us loses it, um, you know, I'll look at Tim and I'll say, where's one? <laughs> or, yeah. Um, well, I hide it, yeah. But, it, I mean, it does happen occasionally. And, um, you know, it's just basically where is it? And, I'll, and whether it's right or not, I'll just hit, hit one. And that, we'll just start from there, you know. It happens to me a lot. It happens to me probably um, maybe three times in, uh, a night. And, um, and I, just, that's, I just look at Keith and I say one. And whatever he's playing at the beginning of his next phrase, he plays one. And it, it doesn't matter who was right or who was wrong or if that's correct. All that matters is that we get on board together as fast as possible. Because uh, we've talked about this. It's like if we're not together on the phrase, the rhythms that we're playing are kind of meaningless at that point. They're just kind of incidental or accidental. So we want to be in agreement as soon as possible, and that's the main goal. And it's just the most efficient way is to have the drums control that, whether they're right or wrong. So what happens if, like, your eyes are closed and you miss a cue or something? Is it just do you re-cue again or yeah. just wait for the next round? Uh, well, it's the next phrase, next or phrase maybe it's it. not appropriate anymore to make that cue because sometimes they're really right for the moment, but once that's gone, they're not right anymore. So... It's, it, it's more important that those two kind of hook up on the cues, because I've I missed a few. Even today, I've missed a few, and, and it just, you just catch up, you know. Well, bass never matters anyway, so. That's true. <laughs> In this band, actually, that's not true. <laughs>
But what, do you ever get a chance to queue? Um, I'll, I'll do it just by, if I hear that, that I want the tempo to go up or down, I might just throw it in and then they'll follow me. I've done that occasionally. I've done it some, you know, but usually Wayne's in charge of the cues. He's like the James Brown of the band. It's, a, it's kind of a visual issue, actually, because yeah. if, if we were all on the same, if it was a democracy as far as the cues, we'd all have to constantly be looking at each other, and that's not practical. Yeah. So sometimes it's easier if I just throw it over my shoulder. They know when to look for them because it's always going to be halfway through a phrase or something. Is that where you normally cue on the fourth measure? No, it's just during the phrase, and it's usually kind of somewhere in the middle of the phrase, maybe. So they know that's kind of a heads up. And if they don't happen to be looking at me, I just wait, as I said before, for the next. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, you and Tim are both very rhythmic uh, players, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you'd like a drummer to complement, like, a rhythmic motive that y'all play. It sort of depends on, like, what, what we're you know, up for at the moment. Uh, it's sort of, sometimes we just kind of play off each other, like Keith's, you know, a great listener, so like kind of anything we bounce off each other kind of comes back in a different way. Or maybe he's just playing two and four. I mean, who knows? I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, I keep saying this to everybody who ever asked me. It's like, there's kind of like, when I play with Keith, there's, <laughs> there's just, uh, everything I've seen to play sounds good with him. It's just, he's just that kind of drummer, so it's sort of, it all kind of works, so you know, it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen with every drummer you play with. Just, just, but I feel that with him. So it's sort of, uh, it makes, you can pretty much do anything you want, actually, in answer to the question, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there's kind of a sort of a magical component that's not too specific. And, but also, I mean, the, the question kind of is, how do you play with someone? Which is really important, you know. Do you imitate what they do? Do you try to play against what they're doing? Do you focus on the dynamic of it and respond to that? Do you play groove if they're not playing groove? Or do you play freer if they're playing groove? And like those are four options about how to respond to somebody musically out of countless options. I mean, it's an infinite, it's whatever your imagination allows. Um, we split the difference between those and whatever else is operating all the time. Like, if, it seems to me like when you're first learning how to play with a drummer, there's this issue of, hey, I'm playing in five, you play in five too, because that'll show that we're listening to each other. And, um, you know, that, that can get kind of corny pretty fast. Sometimes it's appropriate for Keith to actually double something that we're playing. A lot of times I think of it as, Keith is basically just creating a context, this is kind of what Tim was saying, a context rhythmically for that idea to sit in comfortably. And, um, and that's a living thing. That's something that he's constantly reevaluating as the thing unfolds. And a lot of times, the dialogue stuff that Keith was talking about that, that is part of the improvising that we do, it's not like we're just playing a pattern and that pattern repeats forever and then Keith thinks of different ways to play with it. It's constantly changing. The pattern is constantly evolving and turning into something else. So, you know, Keith listens to that, processes it, and somehow accompanies that, you know, in, in a way that to me is always really comfortable. I know that anything I can think of is, as Tim said, is basically going to be sitting, you know, I mean, we're not we're not perfect machines or anything. Sometimes it sounds terrible, you know, and we have to change what we do. But, but I mean, we're always kind of fine-tuning it in the moment to see what is going to make this sound the best it can now. Is it me ignoring that and going back to groove? Is it me playing with it? Is it me, like, playing a contrast to it rhythmically? You know, it's these, these, all these decisions that are possible are, are being made in real time. And, and that's what's so incredible about it, really, is it, there's so many things being decided at every moment. And it's kind of the magic of improvising, you know, not obviously not this band, but anyone improvising. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it is magic. I mean, it's, I can't figure out how it's possible for anybody to think that fast, but, but he does, you know, so. Well, it helps it, that we've, we, like I said earlier, you know, we really have played so much together now over 10 years that a lot of things are really are, you know, we don't even have to verbalize it. We just can figure it out at this point. You know, we really know each other's playing and That's instincts. Uh, you know, it just kind of is more natural than it used to be anyway. I think that's the great thing about a band. You know, it becomes deeper than just putting 
great players together. You know, it, it becomes more than that, you know, a unit. I mean, that reminds me when we play, I'm not sure what tune we're doing next. Riff? We could, we could do this tune um, that really is, the head is a riff. I could demonstrate how uh, I can just play groove, I can play around it, I can play verbatim what they're doing. I could, I could even solo over it, you know, but, um, or I guess it's, it could be kind of like a rhythm, rhythmic counterpoint where I'm playing inside of what they're playing, you know, to thicken it up. Which is sometimes how I think about when I play with a bass player, and um, especially in this band, you know, a lot of the times you're, you are, the kick drum is following the bass line in a lot of popular music and groove music, and that's, that's really what, what it's called for. But then there's also times where you can play inside of it, play around it, or not so repetitive, or... Um, you know, there's, there's many choices you can make that, that will change the feel of the, of the groove. Um, and sometimes it is best to just play the bass line on the, on the kick drum, too. You want to just play the tune, and then we'll talk about it afterwards? That might be best. We'll just play the tune, and then I'll get back to all that.
There were some examples of what I was talking about in there that time a little bit. Um, you know, there, I think a lot of times we as drummers were thinking uh, we got to play that riff on the bass drum, you know. So if I, if I had, it would have really changed the whole feel of it. Um, because that riff doesn't really play one. <laughs> so I'm playing the one to lock it into some kind of groove. Otherwise, it would sound really... Not, not so groovy, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm making that choice. Because um, it, it's one, two, three. So to make it funky, I'm playing in between that. It's uh, 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 and I'm playing, um, we just play the riff once, two, three. I, I guess I played a few choices I could make with that, and I, but I think the the best choice for the for the riff is to play the one, you know, because it needs that. Um, and that's cool how grooves can happen that way, you know. Just saying before how I don't have to play with the bass players playing all the time for it to work, you know. I have a question. Uh, the last song, and just that last example you did when you started to kind of go off, you're doing like a uh, like a roll off the toms onto the snare drum. Looks like it's a paradiddle diddle. I mean, do you, do you know what you're playing there? Um, I do. Seen you, I've seen you play it many times, so it's yeah. a lick you kind of go to. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my uh, one lick I play too much sometimes. <laughs> no, Most not of the time. enough. <laughs> Could you demonstrate that? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I got the idea from, from hearing Elvin Jones do his rolling thing that, that kind of, you really can't write it out most of the time. It's a very organic, just, it's a sound. It's, a, it's something that he's doing that's, Really interesting. Other people have done it too, but I, but I always associate it with Elvin in a way. But I just tried to take that idea and make something out of it that um, that could be a little more in the grid, you know, especially with this band. So I, I just think of it as a roll, as a sound, a double stroke roll, and then you can put the accent wherever you want. Um, and I usually use right left, you know, like an open flam on the toms or, or somewhere else. And with two beats on the bass drum before that accent. So the accent sounds like this. And it, could, it could be really close together or really far apart, um, depending on the, how fast the roll is happening. And then in between that, I'm playing a roll like this. I guess that, that would be... Paradiddle, diddle, diddle. Is that what that is? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. You win. So, you know, there's, there's other ways that you can phrase that to make it more interesting. And I've, I've tried to start it, like, I'll start the, f the accent on, like, the E of a beat. You know, so if I'm playing, like, I'll just give some examples. Like, uh...
there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but that's just one example of. Do you, you ever know, use like a different note value? Instead probably. Instead of like a thirty-second or sixteenth triplet, maybe like slow it down to just a regular triplet kind of phrasing. Probably. I just don't think about it, but I'm sure if you broke it down, just that's however what, you hear it at that moment. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I'll just completely do it out of time, and just feel where I hope the pulse is, and I'll just as a as an effect. Right, right, right. You know. Um. But cool that's lick. basically it. Cool look. Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with that. Yeah, so just to show just a few other examples, a lot of times when I play the, this rolling kind of uh, flurry, I guess is what it sounds like in a way, I, I'm, it's in the moment, so um, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do is just to come up and, and play an example. But what I'm going to do to help me is I'm just going to play some eight-bar phrases and throw in these these things um, in different places at some different tempos so um, within a groove and try my best to, to keep it uh, you know within that phrase so Another example, um, maybe a, a faster tempo. One, two, three, four. They're just going to play with me just to keep some, some time underneath. You guys are going to play more of a time thing, and then I'll roll I'm over. I'm going to try to keep it steady. Okay. So I guess an example in six. And we're just going to keep the eight-bar phrases happening, obviously. One, two, uh, three, four, five, six. <laughs>
you can obviously you can do a lot with that. Um, where it where it stops, where it starts, it can be in really interesting places in the phrase. And um, just one last thing, one one last one that I do a lot at the ends of phrases to to end on a one. If I want to use this as a cool effect to, to come to a one, this last one though would be like. Uh, say if it we're in six. Um, one, two, one, two, three, uh, uh. So it's essentially. That could be used in 4-4 four, four as well, like one, two, three, um. Of course, I'm not going to do that on a Steely Dan gig or uh or, or, you know, something that that, that, that would be completely out of context. Um, but at the ends of tunes, it's a nice way to, you know, to, to have a flurry of sounds or, or some kind of effect in a solo, you know, when it's appropriate, obviously. Yeah, so just um, so you can hear the phrase a little better, how I'm hearing it, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the click on and, and do a couple examples. Um, this one's in six. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. And one more uh, in four. Again, I'm just thinking eight bar phrases and, and throwing it in where, where I hear it at the time. One, two, three. So that last one, I've, I've heard where I could speed up the velocity of it to get to the one. You know, I have no idea what I did, but it's just a feeling and just hearing where the pulse is. So, yeah. This band has such an amazing sound together. Um, how has playing in this environment affected your drums, the sound of them, if any? Well, um, a lot, actually, um, because I started in college experimenting with with this tuning you know because i was studying jazz and and uh learning how to play on more of an open bass drum but i i just took that um basically the same idea but just tuned it down <laughs> you know all the way around so it's not so bebop sounding how is that open bass drum sound 
I guess, affected the creativity because it's really, really unique. It's a great, great sound for this for this trio you have here. It's perfect. Is it something that like the, you developed with the band, or was it pr you brought it in? You brought that into the scenario. I developed it with the band. I was recording myself every Thursday that we played at the 55. I was recording the gigs and listening back and learning from it, learning, you know, where my weaknesses were and where I'd rush, where I'd drag, where I would, you know, you know, I'm always thinking about that stuff, trying to, to be better at, just become a better player overall. But, but um, in those days, I was, I was listening back to it, and I realized how boxy the bass drum was sounding, and it just didn't, wasn't, wasn't really filling out the room like I, I guess I thought it was. Or, and I just started experimenting with this. And um, when you're not mic'd in a small room or in a club setting, it, it really helps kind of give it that sensation that it's being mic'd because it, it just fills out the room more, more low end, there's more air moving. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then it just became part of the band sound, you know, doing it for so long. And, um, and then just experimenting with it and there's different sounds you can get out of the bass drum if you're playing it lighter versus, you know, really digging into it. Um, with an open kick drum, though, I'm always coming off of it because sometimes you'll get a flam effect if you don't. And it helps me to stay relaxed because I'll play a note and then I come off, off the head, and my, my foot can relax until the next thing I play. I'm not just, you know, stuck. You're you know, not into it. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it was just developed over time with this band, as a lot of things did. Thank you. 
This tune has uh, several cues, um, and they're all, um, I guess, composed cues, in a way. Some, yeah. And um, there's three names. One is long, which is a cue that that will will demonstrate that goes into slow. It's like the first half of it is in tempo, and then it's like a drop in tempo, and it goes back. You know, so that's the long cue. And then there's one called four. That's usually how we get back to the original tempo. It's a shorter version of that composed cue. Then there's out, meaning we're taking the, we're going to do the cue, and then we're going to take the head out and end the song. So other than that, there's a head at the top and a head at the end, composed written section. And then those cues kind of, you know, keep us... Uh, uh, getting into new little territories, you know, it gives us something to break it up and then go back to something. That last time we were doing a freeze where we kept going back to something that we froze, you know. First, let's play the cue. Let's play the long cue. Okay, so here's the cue. Uh, one, two, three, ah. Uh. So that, that would be one. So, um. I try to plug it in. Yeah, we'll plug it in. We'll play eight bars and then play it, and then go back to tempo. Two, three, ah. Uh. So that, that was everything all thrown in at once, you know, condensed version of the tune. Really, the reason for cues at all, and, you know, the reason that there's a bunch of cues in this song and that we use them improvisationally in other songs is just to kind of, it's like a reset button for us to have a cue. Because we're, it's all coming out of our heads, most of it, and, and we're going along on a path, and whether the music itself asks for some kind of dramatic change, or whether we feel like we've played everything we can play in that zone or whatever it is, by just calling a cue, it, it sort of ref it's a reset. It refreshes all of our imaginations so we can go off into some other direction or return to the same thing, which we did uh, on this last tune. But we've talked about some of the cues that we do, but really there's no... The cue could be anything. It could be uh, green. We could have a cue called green, and, and whatever we thought green meant... I would call green, and that would direct us in some other direction. It would give us that necessary kind of jumping off point to go someplace else. Um, so th that really evolved out of getting up on a stage and saying, you know, we're not going to really have a lot of written music here. What are we going to do? How do you improvise for two sets and keep yourselves and the audience interested? How do you keep people coming to see that? Who would want to see that? Um, 
Like, so we tried to come up with things that, that kind of optimized our chances of keeping it really fresh and creative all the time because cr creativity is never uninteresting. As long as it's creative, it's interesting. It's interesting to do and it's interesting to listen to. So these cues are just kind of ways to sort of poke ourselves with a stick and say, hey, wake up, you know, here, deal with this somehow. And it could really be anything you can imagine. I mean, I'd, we were kind of into, when the band was working a lot, we were into kind of coming up with new cues to give ourselves. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm sure everybody in this room could come up with 10. Do you have any today. dynamic cues? Huh? Do you have any dynamic cues? Well, we have a cue for quiet, which I did a couple of times, but it, it was at a point where it wasn't very dramatic. And that cue is just shh. I just turn the key and go shh. And that means at the beginning of the next eight, we're down. I thought about having a cue for loud. But with this band, it's really not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to go there. Yeah, it, it, always, it always is growing. You know, whatever it is that we're doing, we rarely stay at one dynamic. It's usually always expanding. So the, re the return to quiet is useful, definitely. A couple times I've seen you play your hands on the snare drum, and it looks like it's like a tabla technique. Have you ever studied tabla or any of the hand percussion? And can you demonstrate a little bit of that? Um, sure. I, I've never studied it. I've only heard it a lot, and I'm, I'm a fan of it. I don't know the vocabulary of tabla at all. <clears throat> but it, it is kind of, in a way, and I never said I want to emulate a tabla, but I guess that's kind of the, 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 the sound it has using the, the harmonics of the head, you know. And, um, and it's, you know how, like, how, at least I did when I was in grade school, I would play on the desk. This would, these two fingers would always be my rolls, and then these would be the accents, you know? So you're like, you know. That's how I practice my drum line, you know, in, in school, you know? So I just took that same technique, and I'm just playing, I'm just basically playing different rolls, five stroke rolls and accents, and I'm hitting a, a rim shot with the finger. Um, and using the muffling, you know, with my left hand uh, after the fact. So that's a, uh, you know, that's just a five stroke roll. Just kind of, but putting it close together, you know. And it's just kind of an effect that I've been working on or came up with somehow with this band probably because they, they use so many different sounds so I had to find ways to, on an acoustic kit to, to get different sounds out of it that were different and interesting and so uh, you know you, when he when Wayne says shh and I get quiet that's kind of the stuff I start thinking of because I've been playing sticks all night I want to do something really drastic so um, you know you can play grooves like that like one two three Something like that. And then, you know, I, and then when I'm playing, sometimes I'll reach over and grab a stick to, to, to bring it up a notch, you know. So if I'm three, four. Of course, I can also grab another stick and use both rims and just come up with something on the spot. Do you ever use brushes or multi rods or? Yeah, I do actually. Like that? You know that that kind of stuff comes in handy for like doing 
studio sessions for more like to get you know different vibes it really records well if you, if you use you know brushes or plastics or anything like that for any like singer songwriter type gigs and you know how about with this band with this band i haven't you know it's just haven't really heard it but um i think for more really low volume music it, it makes more sense there was a band i played with um for a while, uh, David Johansson had a band called the Harry Smiths, and so I played with my hands and brushes and plastics all night. You know, it was very down home, kind of low volume, sitting on the porch kind of band. It was really fun. So it challenged me to come up with things like that. And then I brought it into this band as well. And, you know. I was wondering if you could talk about how you kind of view your role as a drummer in an instrumental ensemble, and then also if. Uh, Tim and Wayne could also talk about how or what they want a drummer to do, I guess, like, I guess how you view the drummer's role in an instrumental ensemble also. I'm providing rhythm and, um, and dictating a lot of, of uh, how the grooves feel along with the other musicians in a group, you know. Everybody works together on that on creating the groove, but um, because I'm the drummer, I'm, I have the authority of it. So I have, to, uh, I have to have a really confident sense of how I want that to sound and what, what that is t to me and, and have that authority and, and take control. Um, and in, in an instrumental setting, I, I'm just trying to be creative and come up with new things on the spot. I feel like that's how I practice in a way, but it's in a musical um, scenario. I'm not in a practice room by myself. I'm playing with musicians that are challenging me and inspiring me to, to find something new every time I play. I'm not, it's not always successful, but that's the goal, you know. I think a really big part of what I would need to have in a drummer is the inspirational thing of, of having from the drums stuff coming at me that inspires me to play. And it's funny, that's not something that automatically happens with good players. Sometimes there's, there's just a connection thing that's not there in terms of the inspiration. And in those cases, then maybe I'll play more of just vocabulary that I have. And I mean, I'm not really a lick player at all anyway, but I mean, there's probably a certain set of quasi-creative in the moment stuff that I do every time I play that I would probably rely on more if there wasn't someone kind of lighting a fire under it. And like I just noticed when we came here today and started playing immediately from both of these guys, I was getting that energy. Like I, I was thinking of things. I had no trouble thinking of what was coming next or anything like that. So that's kind of, that's an intangible. That's sort of a, you know, the magic part that we were talking about before. Um, technically, you know, there's a, to play this music, the drummer needs to be somebody that can keep track of phrases without getting lost, no matter how many superimpositions of other time signatures or over-the-bar phrasing or displacements happen, because that stuff happens all the time when we play. Every second, somebody is doing that. So the drummer, obviously, like the bass player, would need to be able to control that enough and hear it and not let it throw them. Um, and, you know, there has to be kind of... Not, not to not so that there's never a mistake, but just so basically most of the time that's there. And, uh, and you know, obviously the music is groovy. So, I mean, you know, Carlock has all this stuff. So it's, I guess I'm just really talking about his playing, but no matter how interesting it is in terms of complexity, rhythmic complexity, it has to feel good. If it doesn't feel good, there's absolutely no reason to be doing it for me. Because I'm not into the math of it at all. I mean, we're, I think we're all just kind of, these, this is how we hear rhythm, you know? These are our state, these are our melodies coming out. Sometimes our melodies are in 5-8 against 4-4 four, four or, or whatever. Sometimes they resolve strangely, but that's really just the way we're hearing it. We're not thinking about it like, let me make sure this mathematical equation is being understood or something. It's, it's not that kind of vibe. So it has to feel good. It has to be kind of fun. And uh, so that, that would be another thing. And, and then, you know, there's just also, 
has to be somebody you can get along with, you know, and somebody who likes it. That's important to have that. And, uh, well, I want to thank Wayne Krantz and Tim Lefebvre for playing with me today and, and, uh, and you guys being here to, to uh, be interested and uh, make this happen. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. When I was uh, in school, at university level at uh, North Texas, I studied with Ed Sof, who uh, taught the Moeller technique. And uh, it really changed the way that I played a lot because I came from a drumline background. And um, when you're in the drumline, you're, you're, you, everyone has to look the same in the line. And, and it's really more wrist stroke oriented. And, um, and a little more rigid, you know, because it's, it's, everything has to look very regimented and, and uh, all the strokes are the same and um, everything stays pretty low, you know. But when I studied with Ed and I was learning more of a jazz approach and, and jazz touch on the drums, uh, that wasn't working, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't able to get the right sound or the right feel. So he loosened me way up by teaching me this Moeller method. <clears throat> Since then, I think it's kind of morphed into my own version of it. You know, I don't think I do it exactly right, but the concept is the same. And that is that the stick naturally rebounds. And just to demonstrate, <clears throat> you know, when I, I, before I do, I always think of it as, a, as bouncing a ball. You know, you're, you're letting the, the, you're pushing the ball down, it comes back by itself, and you're pushing it back down, you know. So, Back in the drumline days, I would play and stop here, whereas then you would have to lift it back up. <laughs> so now it comes back up by itself. So, so now, you know, I'm just bouncing, you know. And before I go any further, I've developed this open-handed technique where, where I'm just putting my hand out as if I'm shaking someone's hand pretty naturally, nothing contorted or, or strange about it, and just put the stick in, and that's basically, that's it. The thumb is on top now, and my fulcrum is here. So it's just kind of revolving around my thumb, basically. And then these, these three fingers are there to, to help out. So I use mostly finger strokes. And, um, and the left hand is basically the same. You know, my hand's just kind of there at this angle, instead of this angle, um, put it in and, and uh, use the fingers to manip manipulate the stick. I mostly use these two, and these are more just to kind of hold on and push back if I need to, whatever. But um, I'm holding it there, basically, as well, if I really want to open the hand. So they both have that option of really being open, and then the fingers can kind of play along as well. So. <clears throat> Back to the stroke, um, I'm always thinking about the bounce. And there's, there's basically one level where that would kind of be my unaccented note, grace note level. And I'm just bouncing. I'm just basically twitching the fingers, pushing it back down. I'm just bouncing that up and down. I'm not lifting. Because that would be more energy than needs to, to happen. You know, just let the stick naturally come back. You see, I'm really not using the wrist much at all. It's just really fingers, you know. I'm just bouncing. I could probably sit here and do this for a while, you know, without getting too tired, you know. So I'm just bouncing it. But then, if I want to have a little more uh, power or an accent, I can use a little whipping motion like this to, to get a little more out of it. So just putting a little more weight behind the stick. And it's still bouncing back up. It's the sensation of pulling the sound out instead of digging in and getting tense and tight, you know. It just helps me to stay loose. And that's the goal of this whole technique, is to stay loose and relaxed and not work as hard. Let the stick do more of the work for you. So, so there's the other level.
And then, <clears throat> you know, if I need a lot more power, the, the more weight I put behind the stick, the more, you know, power I'm going to have. So I, I have the, the weight of the arm, you know. I'm exaggerating, but sometimes I actually can do this just to get the, the sound I want. But then nothing changes in the hands. I'm still bouncing. See? And it looks ridiculous, but, but that's, that's uh, just to show you nothing in the hands really changes. I'm always thinking about the bounce. So, just some rudimental exercises, type of stuff I warm up on before I show, just random stickings. And it's, I apply that to the kit. At least I try to be conscious of it at all times. Um, the way that I play the cymbals, the way that I play the hi-hat, toms, it doesn't matter. It's all the same, that same feeling of letting the stick come back. Um, like so, just, just to show you. crashing like it doesn't quite bounce back but I have the same feeling of letting it go and just letting it do its thing you know um, if I'm on the hi-hat playing eighth notes the way that I you know instead of getting to where I'm lifting too much or, or getting tight you know just trying to keep it relaxed it's this, the exact same motion so just on the hi-hat you know just just whatever it is, I'm, I'm always thinking of this bounce happening. So three. You know, and if I want to get more power, then I can use the arm and it, you know, it, it stiffens up from time to time to get a certain sound. But overall, I want to always have this, this feeling of, of it coming back. You know, um, and then getting getting the grace notes happening, I use that momentum of of the accent or the backbeat to, you know, I can keep the stick bouncing because of that momentum, catching the bounce, and then just continue to bounce it with the fingers. So, like in a groove situation, I'll just add. I'll, I'll add a couple each time. So if it's like... As an exercise, I guess, but just to show you, I have all those options, and it's, it's coming from that accent, that momentum. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I notice you're really far back on the left hand stick. You're like at the very end. Is that a feel thing for you, just because it gives you more weight? Exactly. I think so. I think it's, it's I've kind of learned, you know, I, I guess when you're, when you're more in the, um, you know, this zone of the stick, the balance point, I guess. Um, you know, you can get a nice bounce, but I've just learned how to get a bounce back here that feels good to me. And um, it's just to get a better wind up for a bigger backbeat because I'm using more of the stick, you know. And, 
Yeah, it's just a feel thing. Just kind of works. And, you know, all this stuff, it's important for me to say, is this is just what I've come up with for myself. Whenever I show people this, this hand technique, I'm not saying you have to play this way, you know, because, you know, we all have our, we can make our own decisions on what works for us. But, you know, if you are feeling tense and tight, I'd recommend at least trying it. Give, give it a shot or at least take something from it. You know, whatever you can do to just, just to kind of relax your hands more, or whatever it takes. Because we don't, we don't want to work too hard. We want to use, you know, we want to be able to, to execute whatever we hear and not be hindered by our technique, you know. It should be for music. And, um, and that, you know, my setup is very, everything's really close. Um, I don't, like, you know, I don't want to work too hard to get to something. So everything's just right here and, and comfortable for me, you know. I think that's what's important, is just finding what works for you. And, and this is what I've come up with so far. Can you explain your approach to foot technique? Yeah, um, I basically play on the bass drum pedal. I play heel up, and I kind of pivot my foot in the, in the middle of the footboard. I seem to get a nice balance there. And um, I'm sure I move around on the footboard depending on what I'm playing, but I think generally it's, it's here. And, um, and when the kick drum is, is uh, tuned like this, I'm definitely pulling, not pulling off, but letting it bounce back, just like I do the hands, you know, I kind of feel it the same way. So the, the beater's hitting the head and coming back always. And then I can rest my leg, you know, put my heel down at that point, if there's time, depending on what, you're pl what I'm playing, um, to relax. And um, so, you know, basically looks like this. You know, my heel is up, and uh, I'm just kind of pivoting my, my ankle and using the leg for, for uh, added weight and power if I need it. If I were to dig into the head with it tuned this way, I'd get a little flutter sound. Because um, it's kind of flamming, you know, because the air is inside the drum moving around. Um, so that's another reason I, I need to come off of it. When I play an, a, a kick drum that is muffled, um, I have the option. Sometimes I dig in just for feel, you know, or just if I'm really hitting hard. It just, sometimes that does feel good. You just lay into it. Um, but when you're coming off the head, you're going to get a different sound. It's, it's going to resonate more and you're going to get more vibration. So I think for the most part, I'm always thinking about coming off, you know, um, and just letting it resonate and do its thing. The left foot on the hi-hat is, uh, I guess, pretty similar. I'm always heel up and, uh, you know, I do a lot of, um, splashes where you you kind of kick the pedal if I'm riding and I want to have like an open hi-hat effect um, do a lot of that in, in certain phrases and you can let them kind of ring together if you want it to last longer But that's, you know, basically all I have to say at this point about it. It's, but it's just, also, I really want to stay relaxed down there and not get tired and tense. That's a conscious effort. Do you ever get into double bass drumming? I actually used to play double, double pedal. And when I first started playing, I actually did have two bass drums. Um, it just got to where the music that I was getting called to play and the, and the gigs that I've done just really was it necessary, except for the ends of songs where you do the bugga dugga dugga, <laughs> maybe or something, but I just didn't want to do that, and, and I just didn't hear it. I just, um, it just wasn't quite working for what I was getting called to do, and it forced me to, to uh, try to do different things with the hi-hat, you know, with, uh, with the foot, and, um, you know, using it as another voice instead of just uh, for eighth note grooves, you know, I used it 
obviously, as you've seen that I've been playing uh, today, just kind of using it as another voice on the kit that's, that's not always constant. It can, it can be whatever you want it to be, really. You know? Mm -hmm. Could you demonstrate some of those heel splashes and maybe some multiple strokes on your bass drum inside of a groove? Multiple strokes? Sure. Yeah, I like we're doing like maybe three strokes or th two strokes. So yeah. Just one. I mean, everybody knows how to do the one stroke. Something like two, three, uh. It's fun to, you know, use this as a, as you would poss possibly, uh, you know, I, instead of a bass drum, I'm just playing a hi-hat with the foot, and a lot of interesting things just happen automatically. Yeah. Could you demonstrate some of the stuff you do before you go on stage? Um, That's like a warm-up routine or anything? I'll get the pad for that. Uh, you know, I'll do just different... Uh, hand combinations, you know, whether it's just fours on each hand, add a flam at the top of the one, you know. Maybe do threes. Add a flam. That kind of stuff. And then, uh, of course, I'll start slowly <laughs> and work up to that. Um, and just different combinations like... Um, just to kind of let this, this bounce happen, get that kind of nice and... Flowy. And then, and then I'll just place different things uh, that I remember from the drumline days, you know, just whatever comes to mind. You know, just whatever I can do to just work each side evenly and just get both sides feeling nice and warm. Was there anything that you worked on to kind of heighten your mental concentration for just to kind of be able to make it through these long and intense gigs, you know? Just like anything, just from doing it for many years and, and almost every day of my life. It's just kind of how I'm programmed and um, obviously getting good rest and eating well is going to help, you know, uh, but just, that's just kind of all I've ever done, so I, that's just what I know, and um, it's year after year, I, I, se I seem to get, you know, a little, it gets easier the more you do it, I think. Yep. Keith, you use a lot of odd phrasing in your playing. I was wondering if there's anything you worked on to develop that. Um, I don't think there's anything... Uh, other than, you know, listening to players that do that, that influence me. Um, listen to people like Tony Williams or, or Elvin or, um, you know, any... A lot of jazz drummers play over the bar line, you know. And, and, um, but those two really, really hit, hit home with me. Just not trying to play like them, but just the spirit of it, the listening to those records and... And just hearing the phrases that they played by just listening to it over and over and over, and then it just became, oh, I could kind of hear what, more what was happening. And um, a way that I used to practice um, 
because I I do it more in in a rock funk you know uh, R and B way maybe using sixteenth notes instead of triplets and a swing feel you know but it's the same concept really um, so one way I used to practice it was just playing along to um, records that were in eight bar phrases because um, you, you get to where you hear those phrases really naturally you know like a verse of a song is usually going to be eight bars so I would just play along to to um, sequence records that were as I was growing up that were popular and as an exercise I would just play along I wouldn't play the song I would I would improvise over what I was hearing so I was one thing it was doing was I was working on creativity responding to the vocals or responding to the bass line or whatever was going on or playing in the middle of it in the gaps you know answering the vocal line things like that but always knowing where those phrases are and then it's also you're working on your time because it's nowadays we really do have to be able to play with a click you know because it's it's done so much in recording these days so you know it was helping me with with that also um, and really playing with Wayne Krantz's group and other groups that I've played with that allow me that freedom that's really where it, it happened you know just doing it week after week and just working on it you know and um, I mean I could play a really basic phrase where I'll play eight bars and then the next eight bars I'll, I'll play a fill into the f into the next eight bars but I won't stop a at one um, you know I'll, I'll go to um, uh, let's see I'll go to three of the first bar of the next phrase um, th just simple things like that is a good way to start to, and then to also know where you are but that's really not one that's a three of the next you know the next phrase so I guess that that would be something that you could start with something like that um, so if we're here one two three four See, I'm counting it <laughs> to show that I know where I am and, and uh, I'm just improvising around it. And that's what I used to do. I'd be listening to uh, whatever, uh, the Thriller record or something, and uh, playing around Michael's vocals. It's just not that you would play it that way, you know, obviously, but it was just an exercise and it, it was more of a musical way to do it instead of just having a click pounding in your ear, you know. And, um, most pop music is eight bar phrases so it just covered everything so it's just a suggestion but um, mostly just listening to players that do that and it inspires you to figure out what they're doing transcribing or whatever it takes well I just want to thank you guys for being here and uh, making this happen uh, really appreciate it and uh, your interest and your questions and uh, really made it uh, a lot of fun so thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.